This is Growth Guide, a podcast exploring the depths of curiosity, questioning everything in the name of growth. I'm your host, Brian D'Alessandro. Dr. Rich Blundell is a scientist trained in big history, which is the story of the cosmos and our place in it. His latest work focuses on ecological intelligence. Ecological intelligence allows us to comprehend systems in all their complexity, as well as the interplay between the natural and man-made worlds. It offers us a way of seeing and believing that reveals the magic in the mundane and the sublime in the subtle. It's also a lived experience of cosmic ecology that anyone can have. Here you'll find small stories and big ideas that reflect a heightened awareness of connection to something bigger, often by connecting to something smaller. Rich is a really interesting dude. He lives on a boat, constantly connected and in tune with nature. He also crafts beautiful, one-of-a-kind surfboards. In this episode, we discuss modern science, leadership, relationships, organizational development, and the arts at this critical time in human history. This mind-bending episode is sure to take you on a passion-filled ride, so let's get to it. Rich, man, so good to see your face. Thanks so much for joining today. I'm excited to dive right in with you. You too, Bri. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. We connected probably about uh, seven, eight years ago, and we quickly learned that neither of us have the patience or even maybe the ability for small talk, right? We just dove right (laughs) into big topics. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, we're already through it. So if you're looking for small talk, that was it. Yeah. Right. You know, that bond is deep and uh, I I love that we could pick right off on that. So let's let's do that. Um, But for some context of listeners who don't know you, let's get some of your background of, you know, first off, how did you find your way to science? It was uh, fairly accidental. My affinity for science actually comes from my relationship to nature. My only goal in life that I can really like identify clearly was a desire to be outdoors. I know I'm in my truck right now, but to be in amongst the trees and the birds and things. And that goes all the way back to my childhood, you know, kind of growing up as a wild child. So that that's how, that's why science uh, resonated for me, was that it seemed like the only and the best route to be in nature as much as possible. I, I struggle with that too, but I'm, you know, like this idea that, you know, we have all of these narratives about what science is. And I, I think it is sort of relevant to point out that for me, science is about nature. It's not necessarily about the development of new pharmaceuticals or high tech devices and the science behind them. It's not that. It's really about the natural world and that science is one of the best ways that we know to to know the natural world. And so is it about knowing, learning, understanding, appreciating, and um, collaborating with nature? It has become that. Uh, Originally, it was just much more about the experience of nature, wanting to be in the experience of nature. That's it. And then it as you enlist yourself into the science track, you know, in terms of like our formal education system, you know, tries to you know, put us into these different categories of, you know, are you artistic? Are you humanities? Are you a literature person? Are you a math person? Are you a science person? Mm -hmm. You know, once, you know, once that takes hold, you sort of along for the ride for a while. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that that putting into a box, and it's that, you know, Rockefeller era of reinventing education and the workplace and really all of our industries. But, um, you know, it's become this thing where if you're not considered an expert and have ownership around a specific domain, and I'm using those words intentionally, ownership and domain, um, you know, (laughs) you're less valuable. And, you know, it reminds me of this quote that is, that is probably one of the most misquoted quotes out there. Uh, The idea that a jack of all trades and master of none, boo, like it's said as a negative against the person. But uh, have you ever heard the full quote? No. So that's actually an excerpt. The full quote is, Jack of all trades and master of none is always better than a master of one. All right. 
Nice. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, as my fellow brother MacGyver, um, you know, who wears many hats and pulls on a myriad of tools to solve whatever challenge is in front of you, I believe that it's a very important quote for this period of time, because it's not about just being able to do one thing, the resilience, the ingenuity, the creativity that is demanded of us to overcome the challenges some man created and some natural is hypercritical. And I think there's an opportunity to shift that and really start opening ourselves up to releasing these labels. Absolutely. However, at the same time, I also want to acknowledge that there is value in specialization. Like, I don't want to abandon and necessity. specialization. No, 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 no. And necessity. Absolutely. It's, it's just yeah. that the pendulum has swung too far, right? When you have a pilot yeah. flying a plane, you want them to be a fucking specialist. <laughs> like, Right, right. Yeah, and not just the guy who knows how to take off. No, that, that needs to be their thing. And you don't want them to be like, okay, this is your captain speaking. I'm going to come back and uh, serve the drinks now. So I'll see you in a minute. <laughs> but you're right. We have overvalued specialization to the point where now it's starting to come full circle and say, well, wait a minute. This is causing a lot of injury and a lot of we're missing out on a lot of nuance because of that. And yeah. that's, I think that's a, you know, it's a natural cycle. And I'm happy to be a part of it. And there's different personality types. Some people focus better on one thing others it's about having that flow I think what it boils down to for me if we look back to nature is is there full flow and you know a lack of constriction once being put into a box and doing one thing it feels constricting rather than freeing and and because it could it could produce either one but for the individual if it's creating constriction there's something that needs to be freed up so that there could be a better flow Sure. I get that. I get that. And um, I think what you're saying is reflected in, you know, it's funny because when I'm asked, you know, like, because I spend a lot of time in the academic world speaking with, you know, real scholars, you know, when they ask me, like, what is your area? You know, like, what is your domain? I have to say that I, uh, I specialize in everything because the field is called big history which is the, uh, you know, it's the history of the universe that includes human history. So there's this real attempt to bring everything back together, you know, to re, to bring coherence to all of these different uh, silos of knowledge. That's what the field that I happened to get my highest degree in was in big history, which is a, uh, you know, a comprehensive account of knowledge. That's what it is. But don't expect me to give, you know, really specific i I don't have knowledge that's like really deep it's more that it's really broad and then what are the insights and wisdoms that are available once you do take that broad view of things now uh, for a little more context on you because you know you mentioned that you you know from a young age were this wild child and um you have this love for being in nature. And one thing I want to point out as a scientist, you're pretty unique. I think you definitely go against the norm in that you've gone through high levels of academia and you've maintained your freedom and your autonomy where I think the natural, and I don't say this negatively, the natural indoctrination that often happens in the academic systems, you experience that, but you've not taken it on and allowed it to to erode your true connection to nature and that freedom. I mean, you, you live largely on a boat, right? Um, so you're connected to the water, you make surfboards and uh, are surfing often. So you're, you're, you know, when we first um, did an event together, it was called Big History, A Surfer's Guide to Understanding the Universe, right? So there, there is this deep connection to how you approach science in a way that is intertwined with nature. And, and it, it's worth pointing out. I can't deny any of that. <laughs> <laughs> so big history, a topic that definitely changed my life, uh, you know, in shifting my perspective and bringing me back to feeling the unification of the whole universe, the whole cosmos, and my relationship to it in a linear timeline. Can you uh, just, you know, talk a bit about what big history is to you? Sure. I like that you 
drop that little linear in there because it is linear and I can already feel like it's worth challenging that, you know, is it really linear? And however, it is linear in well, the way it's presented. And, and I would also say that because the human experience is bound by um, space and time, we experience this life most of the time as linear. I personally sure. believe that that story is linear cyclical and spherical all at once it just depends yes. on how we look at it i get it and, and and actually it is the big history linear narrative that makes that sort of available makes that option sort mm. of you can start to discern that that might that there's something to that i i i can't claim to know what that is like i, I can't say for sure but knowing the linear narrative you know, insufficient detail definitely opens up the possibility that we, there's a lot we don't know. You know what I mean? There mm. is a fundamental mystery that's embedded within this linear narrative that might one day explode the linearity of it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I can't say what that is, but I have a sense that, wow, given how little we really do know, w what does that mean, you know, for what we do know? It, it's, it's a, it's precarious. But it's also beautiful because even the limitations that we have in, in where we're able to grasp and see things currently, it kind of fuels our progress towards uncovering that next level. Like for instance, the linear timeline is really important for me in that it allows me to see that from the Big Bang, everything that has unfolded and evolved up until this point leads directly to me in this present moment, as it does for you, as it does for every living being in the universe. And there is such a power in that. 50 years ago, if you had said that, we could have, we could have said, oh, that sounds a lot like woo-woo. But, but everything that we know about the cosmic narrative, the story since the Big Bang, actually is not only consistent with what you just said, but it's becoming more and more uh, inescapable as a, as, a, as a reality. Um, do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the more and more we know, the more this idea that everything that has happened since the Big Bang to this moment, you know, is, is a continuity. It is an ontological continuity that there is, this, there, there is this thread of connection that goes all the way back to the Big Bang. That said, the very nature of our knowledge and the way we, our epistemology, the way we, the way we uh, generate knowledge, it precludes us from knowing what happened before the Big Bang. And that is where the mystery really is. Like mm -hmm. if we, we, yeah, and we've done this amazing job of, of slicing time into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller pieces so that we can, you know, in order to reduce it down so that we can begin to try to understand time. And, and we get all the way down to this thing called the Planck unit or the Planck time, 10 to the negative 43 seconds, mm -hmm. which is this, which is this incomprehensibly small amount of time. But that's it. We can go no further than that. Mm -hmm. Anything smaller than that makes no sense in the current paradigm of physics, in the current paradigm of knowledge, which means that anything that happened prior, which is a weird word, but prior to 10 to the negative 43 seconds, we have no access to it. We, it's not that we don't know it, it's that we can't know it. How fucking cool is that? Like, it's, it's- Look at, how it's, long ago was it, Rich? You'll, you'll be a closer, uh, you know, date than me. Like, when did we think that if we went to the edge of the earth, we would fall off it? I know some people still currently think that, but when was that the- common public perception <laughs> i i don't know but what but, thousands of a few thousand years ago yeah, sure so sure in, in a few thousand years right. the edge of our exploration went from being the edge of the planet which the planet was not mapped yeah. so the perception of the planet was much smaller than it actually even was and now we're mm -hmm. saying that would it how many uh plonk is it 10 to negative 43 seconds okay so the the space between you know the edge of the world and that 
is so massive in such a short well, period of time. And not only that, now what is that really saying? Is that saying that there's some kind of um, limit to the universe, or is it saying that there's some kind of limit to science? Or a limit to hum humanity. And I would say, yes, all of them, because okay. they're all interconnected. <laughs> there's this concept yes. in, um, you know, in ancient astrology, and it still carries through today. But the concept was, you know, back when like they, they could only see four planets, right? Um, then the fifth one was revealed. There is this concept that a planet doesn't, it's not about just our technology being able to see it. A planet cannot be revealed with all of its information that it holds until we're ready to hold that information. And so the interconnectedness of the two is beautiful until even our consciousness and our science expands to a place where we could see beyond this um, universe or the, beyond the, the Big Bang. It can't be revealed. It's this, this yeah, cosmic what, what rites of passage. What you're talking about there is what I would call ontological continuity, that those two things are inextricable, that, that, that what we don't know and what we claim to know are of the same thing. They are of the same category, for lack of a better word. So that has, that has in, immense philosophical and social and personal and political and economic and ecological impact. You know, like that idea that we're just now even ready to start reconsidering. I think earlier sort of thinkers did start to like Aristotle and, um, you know, Descartes was a, Try, was trying desperately to figure out this this thing um and we've we've been put on a path for the, you know four or five hundred years now that was comfortable with this other interpretation but now that interpretation is failing obviously like and we see its failure manifests in the world around us um so we're starting to have to now backtrack and find where we sort of got off the rails and uh, that's, the, that's the current exercise, really. The big history part is essential. It's a critical piece to this because all of those thinkers that have been sort of guiding us, all of the received wisdom that we have, they didn't have it. They didn't have a, a modern cosmology. I want to I wanna put the caveat in that I'm the, I am a critic of the modern cosmology, but the, but the point is we, they didn't have it. And now that we do, can we go back and start to re reassess all of that stuff? And the good news is, is that a lot of the philosophical rabbit holes that we've gone down, you know, in the past several centuries become irrelevant. In other words, their utility is really to understand how they're all wrong, as opposed to how we need to in integrate them. We don't need to integrate them. We just need to see them as wrong terms. And isn't that what science is about a lot of times? I think in its, in its ideal, I think the original science, that's what it was about. It's become, it's become something else. It's become wrapped up in market games and politics. And a lot, it's been corrupted by a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. But in its ideal sense, which is the science that I love, again, this goes back to like, it's really about wanting to just know nature, to have a relationship with nature, to mm -hmm. be with nature, and ultimately discover that you are nature. That's really the science that I'm talking about. My point of all of that was really just to say that the, the big history narrative, which is the story, I'm almost hesitant to call it big history because big history is trying to do what, you know, what most academic disciplines do, which is to turn it into a body of knowledge as opposed to a lived experience. So the point there is that knowing some of the details, you don't need to know all of them, but knowing some of the broad outlines of the story of the universe the cosmology that we have that science has revealed has something to offer today has something to offer the circumstances of today that's profoundly ameliorative to 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 where we are and i would go so far as to say essential for us to get through the current moment that we're in and that on the other side of this moment there is something bigger and better hard to see from where we are but it does exist i'm not i'm not painting a utopianist picture i want to be clear about that that's that's naive 
but I'm saying that understanding the big history story, story of the universe has something new to offer us. And, and I think I know the outlines of what that new thing is. And it's really exciting to, um, to, to feel it start to unfold in culture, at least in small pockets of culture. Mm. That's the proposal, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and you and I, uh, you know, I love that we share a positive outlook for humanity and for the planet and, um, you know, focus on solutions. Um, I'd love to hear about this proposal as, as rough as it is and as it's taking form. I'd love to see your observations and, um, yeah. Well, in a nutshell, human beings have, inher- at least in the West, you know, in the, in the sort of civilized, modern western part of humanity have inherited um some uh dualisms and some uh stories that don't deliver on our impulse to belong they tend to separate isolate and democratize us you know atomize us um And it has shaped our identity in a way that is unnecessarily inhumane and that the natural sciences are revealing all kinds of hints as to how to heal that. I don't want to say solve that, but to heal that. I align with to heal that because it's it's not something that's lost. It's not something that has gone away. That connection exists and is real. And so it's, it's more about the perceived experience of disconnection. Yeah. And I think it's a question of distraction too. Like, like in some ways we've forgotten this thing, but in a lot of ways we're just distracted by it. We're distracted, uh, we're numbed, we're depressed. I mean, it's all of these, these um, noise elements that bring us away. So all of those are the necessary precursors to actually seeing it. Like you kind of have to get to that state before you can actually begin to consider something that's radically different. And this thing is radically different, but it also feels incredibly comfortable and attractive. Uh, which one feels attractive? The current state? No, a new state, a new, a new fundamental sense of identity that we have forfeited once you know you've got it but you've got to feel alienated for that thing to become visible again that's that's kind of what i'm saying and so is that your personal experience that there's a comfort in that new version because i would say at large the majority of humans don't currently see it that way i i I truly hope they get there and get there swiftly but uh, i think that the change element is terrifying to most well, that's a job for, that's what art is for. That's yeah. what art is for. Art is, I think, is mm. about, or if it, if it hasn't been historically, and I think it actually it was. Has. It pre-histor- has, pre Prehistorically it has. But in more recent times, it has lost its purpose. You know, it's lost its kind of way. And I think it needs to be, I think art needs to find its uh, purpose again. Mm. And that purpose is to offer us many different ways, modalities, as you might say, of engaging with this this what i call ecological intelligence which is the it's not about something that you know that we know it's about something that's out there to be known ecological intelligence is the intelligence of nature it's out there and it exists in relationships that's what ecology means ecology is the study of relationships what i'm saying is that there is this intelligence ecological intelligence which resides in relationship that um we now have access to and and artists who who can sense and many of them can artists who can sense that the energy of that relationship and the the energy of that intelligence can bring it into their work and then their work embeds that intelligence and because i'm naive enough to think that art creates culture art that embeds ecological intelligence will bring ecological intelligence to culture and then we'll start to have a culture that that cultivates our capacities to see this intelligence that we're immersed in and then that comes in to kind of ameliorate and to heal all of the injury that we've inherited i know that all sounds Mm. very idealistic well first off can you uh define ameliorate because i don't know what that means (laughs) the root is mel mel melliferous like honey like Mm. so it's about honey sweetening sweet about sweetening it's about 
making something sweeter, making it feel better, making it taste better, mm. making it. So ameliorating means to, uh, to bring comfort and joy and uh, healing. That's what it means. Beautiful. To ameliorate. And now back to what you said, uh, I, I don't actually think that it's all that idealistic. And the same way that you said, you know, in the past, science would have labeled, you know, things like big history as, um, as woohoo. Um, labeling that as idealistic, I think, is just um, lacking the ability to see the underlying science. And so let's look at that. You said you might be yes. naive enough to um, believe that art creates culture. I would say scientifically that's true. Now, culture isn't the idealistic sense of culture in, in bringing everything that's great and expansive to people. Culture is, got, it's got a spectrum. It could be something positively influential or it could be something negative and constricting and destructive. And so- Well, can I ask you on the whole, would you say that culture today is good or bad or would you even avoid that question? No, I wouldn't avoid the question, but I wouldn't say it's good or bad. Um, I would say that what I would say, and this is on, on that scientific level and, and you could, you know, I'm not a scientist, so I'm talking out my ass here, but so feel free to cut me down. But um, I would say, let's look at the, the, the flow of energy that's being supplied through this relationship, because all relationships have that. And so what I bring that to is, what is the underlying currency? And I even love the word currency, it has current in it, right? That electrical flow. So what is the currency? The current currency of art is about money, it's about power, it's about control. So it's reflective of a lot of the same systemic issues that we're facing. Now, when you talk about art and its ability to um, transcend and expand humanity, I believe the currency is then about connection. It's about that expansion. It's about exploration and curiosity, trying to understand and express things that can't be put into words. And in fact, I'm going to go to art to speak to this, right? I'm going to, okay. you know, use the, the Rumi poem of out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing. There is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul wow. lies down in the grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. The breeze at dawn has secrets to tell you. Don't go back to sleep. You must ask for what you really want. Don't go back to sleep. People are going back and forth across the door sills where the two worlds touch. The door is round and open. Don't go back to sleep. Holy shit. Wow. Okay, so that dude, is it a dude? It's a dude. Yeah, that's a dude. Uh, and, and by the way, I want to, you know, this is um, a translation into English. Uh, I've, I've heard this poem spoken in original okay. tongue, so much more beautiful. And I understand the degradation that we experience through translating it. So I believe okay. the original is even deeper and more connected than the English translation. Sure. Yeah, that's true of anything that we have to convert into language that 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 translation into language, any language, is going to lose, it's going to modify the, the thing, but we do get a sense for what was the experience there. Mm -hmm. And that experience, like, uh, well, that is a universal experience, I think. And uh, it's and it's a very much an experience of the universe experiencing itself. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, so that's Rumi, that's poetry. I'm just trying to like, say like, you know on the one hand that's poetic but on the other hand it's basic science it is basic science it is it is a description of reality this is what i'm trying to say now here's the beauty here's the beauty rewind to when this was written okay so rumi was uh born in 1207 right so the current science available had not proven most, if not all, of what he's talking about there. Where now, was he? Where was he? Uh, he was. Uh, I, I want to see what it was called then. Yeah, I guess Persia. I guess it was. It was technically Persia. But, so. First of all, all that makes that makes perfect sense. That you know that that would be something written by uh, a sensitive person with the capacity to record their experiences. That makes sense. That that's what he that that would be the experience of the world. Um, so wow, we've really lost that. 
Mm-hmm. Well, we've on forgotten one it, level, right? we're really lost. It. Yeah, but we also also carry it because actually Rumi inherited it. He inherited it as an animal, as a you know, as a human, and as a mammal, and as a you know, as a yeah. vertebrate, as a you know. Right on down the line, as an extension of that that story of big history, right? I mean, it's right, all carried back. through. I, 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 and I'm arguing, you know, treacherously, I'm arguing that it goes all the way back. You know, it goes all the way back at least to the Big Bang, certainly into the cosmic microwave background radiation. We can see the precursors to what ultimately comes to Rumi, then gets corrupted <laughs> for a lot of reasons. But now we're beginning to reconsider what he, that experience is mm-hmm. and, and 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 how it's consistent with what the science is actually saying by the way this whole this whole rift between science and spirituality is a fiction it is an it's a political accident you know it was it's written you know into you can trace this schism back to decisions made by people wanting to preserve power and or keep themselves from being persecuted in one way or another. So it's not like it's a real schism. It's we we have the historical record that shows us how this was just a big mix up. That's why Rumi's Rumi, you know, that's why that's why that's why he's out there on the Internet today. And that's why art is out there, I believe. Art is the exploration of ideas we can't and feelings we can't necessarily articulate or prove. And it's an act of exploration. Art isn't right or wrong. It's not about, you know, um, judgment. It's about what does it make you feel? How does it make you feel? Not am I feeling good or bad? And that's something we need to be comfortable with. And even in the current, um, you know, rhetoric we carry with, uh, and and the style of communicating with people, it's it seems so adversarial. And people are looking for either confirmation bias or they're looking to to you know prove someone that they're right, and the other person's wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and all of that goes away once you belong. Like once mm-hmm. you have a sense of deep belonging to the once the subject and object find ways of you know interpenetrating each other that adversarial sort of stance that adversarial energy it goes away because it becomes unhelpful and irrelevant and um and then new relationships form from there Mm. so I mean, this is just, these are just things, that you, this is just ecological intelligence. I'm really just reciting ecological intelligence, that things will tend on the whole toward the preservation of complexity and life and, and um, the good. So all we need to do is let that happen, in some sense, get out of its way by getting, by putting ourselves directly in the path of it. Mm. Whoa. But it's putting ourselves in the path of it as in not standing in front of an adversary, but rather looking in a mirror. Yeah. And relinquishing all these other options that have kind of failed us, you know, by do do the right thing after exhausting all possible options. We find ourselves in the path of nature. We find ourselves back in nature. Mm -hmm. And um, that's going to have profound consequences i I, i'm I'm convinced yeah it resets the the relationship it resets i i look a lot at like the containers and contents and you know nature being this um earthly container for all of this life when we are Mm. in communion with that container and and filling that space Um, we inform it as much as it informs us. And And how convenient is it that all of these containers have permeable boundaries? Like Mm -hmm. all of these containers Mm -hmm. are permeable, you know? And yet they're real the same way that, you know, we're talking about this oneness and interconnectivity, the same way there are all these boundaries, yet at the same time, we are all one collective whole. And when scientifically when we zoom into these atoms you have the space of many football fields in between atoms and there are fractals expressed across all of these scales that are 
the evidence, if you're looking for evidence, every fractal that you encounter, you know, whether it's in the pattern of a tree in a hand or in the clouds and the ocean or in, you know, even subatomic scale fractals. Yeah, everything is kind of an expression of a fractal at, at some scale. And so what that reveals to me anyway is that it, every one of those fractals is a bridge. Is a bridge. It's a bridge that connects connects one thing to something else through some, you know, through some complex sort of lineage between them, some complex relationship. Every fractal that you encounter is evidence and a reminder that everything is connected. Mm. I mean, these are just things that pop out of the story of the universe as science tells it to us. These are just insights that pop out of it. You, they're inescapable. You can ignore them, but they're there. And people do choose to ignore them because they're either too complex to tackle or they're too far outside of one's area of expertise or what, for whatever reason. Right. Or they don't support the uh, chosen underlying currency for that system. Right. So back when I was talking about currencies, you know, let's look at some of our systems since this is a critical part of our transformation in humanity um, and especially into coming back into harmony and alignment with the natural world so the underlying currency for most corporations right it's it's the uh, fiduciary responsibility to the shareholder and there's also usually a currency or culture of control power and this is where the shift needs to take place. It's about how that energy flows within that container. And so the same way the earth and nature creates a container that's conducive for us to feel that connectivity, we need containers for our organizations that do the same. And so I don't think the structures need to change too much. I think it's more the underlying, the foundation, the values. The philosophies and the identities of the people who participate in these structures mm -hmm. that's my my yep. take on the it. relationships like, between them I, I i forget about changing the corporation and you know forget about legislating and regulating the corp corporation go in and find the, the 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 deep cognitive structures that have created those bigger expressions and give them uh, options give them other ways of um, visualizing how we can coordinate, visualizing how we can, you know, it's funny because you use the phrase fiduciary responsibility to shareholders. Like, talk about hedging, you know, like fiduciary responsibility to share. How about just responsibility to shareholders? Like, why is it the response? You know, because the currency, the is currency is the fiduciary. dollar bill. Yes, right, right, and so like. Well, and so why has the dollar come in and taken its pl taken place as the currency of choice? Well, who cares why? But is that a good thing? Like, do we think that's do we think how sustainable is that? How much suffering is that creating? And can, and could we do better it's on that? And so, yeah, I think. But that. I think that's I think that's what the crypto sort of thing that's happening right now is. Oh, without a doubt, it's in response. Yes, and it's it's getting hijacked in in some ways by the old sort of fiduciary responsibility stuff. But but I do think that somewhere in there, you know, when I look at Ethereum and the and the philosophy below it and mm -hmm. decentralized finance, and I look at you know all of those tools are also you know available now to us to to gradually. I'm not saying we need to do it in a way that exactly. is that is that is too explosive. You know what I mean, or implosive, but that we can now use these tools to relieve the pressure, mm -hmm. relieve the pent up trauma that these that this other thing has created. Yeah, not by any particular person, but just by the the, the, the inertia of the ignorance that we've had in the past. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but that our incomplete understandings have this inertia that have created these structures that are not sustainable and actually existential. So now we can start to use these new technologies to relieve that pressure and uh, create the cultivate the ground for something more with more ecological intelligence. 
Spot on. And I think the idea of cultivating the ground is a great one because uh, we align with how we see the change happening. It's not through a sense of force. It's not through um, shame or blame or any of that. It's, it's about the ground. It's about the soil. If you care for the soil, your crops will thrive. And I think that's what we need to return to. And in this case, the soil is that environment, the culture, mm -hmm. it's the values underlying right. and, and having that sense of clarity and alignment by those participating, that shifts the currency back into one of values. And whatever those you know, specific values are for an initiative, a project, an organization, that becomes an underlying currency and it breeds a culture that supports that. We've all had an experience of going into an environment, an activity of space. Let's, let's say the, the childhood playground and you go in there where you're with friends, you're collaborating, you're playing together, someone starts a game and you start to join in. Um, it's clear that there's no hitting allowed. There's no stuff that is, is violent or disruptive to a point where it, it ruins the game because everyone is there because they're enjoying playing mm -hmm. a game with each other and they're sharing in that. And the joy that you experience from that is amazing. You have your own individual experience. You might be the person who goes over and starts building the shop for you know the ice cream stand that you guys are pretending you're running. Someone else might be pretending to be making the ice cream. You could be working completely separately, but you've agreed upon what that initiative is. And everyone is autonomous and they're in joy because they're doing it. So that's art. Like what you just, the story you told is a kind of art that embeds a fractal. There's a fractal in there. Like I can see the fractal that's like that these games, the things we do as play actually are fractals of things that we do in society, mm -hmm. you know, in economic, in economies. Yeah. And, and so there's a fractal there. And by telling that story, by, by creating that art you just did, now we have a chance to converse about it. Here we are conversing about the art you just created. And in, in its own subtle ways, that will create a culture that, 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 further fractalized out and amplified and replicated into the world will create a culture that embeds that fractal. Exactly. And anyone who experiences it or sees it and resonates with it, well, they might choose. It's not, then it's not gibberish. It's not gibberish to them. And then they might choose to join in or they might choose to replicate it or evolve it. Now, let's say on the other hand, you have someone come in who's, you know, a bully right? They're, they're coming with, and, and a bully, meaning they come with their own traumas, their own wounds, because that's yeah. really what it is. It's not who they are. Yeah. It's how they're right. acting. But that's really important that you had the maturity to say that. Because otherwise, we're just saying, bu you bully, you know, like, here's the problem with a lot of our current human situation, right? The whole cancel culture and everything. It's about shame, blame and condemning. And there is nothing productive that comes out of it. And in fact, it strengthens the same underlying issue that has created it. It is an expression of trauma. Yes, I, I experience that a lot. It's, it's treacherous ground that I am eager to tread. Me too. But it's a whole other podcast. Yeah. While we're on the subject, I wanted to try and express something to you. That one of the things that occurred to me was that, uh, okay, so you and I, a couple of white guys growing up in the privilege and abundance of a you know of a temporary culture with all the sort of advantages and comforts and technologies and you know we're just inc just absurdly um privileged mm -hmm. and you know but we're kind of we've inherited this and it's it's our normal but we've also done enough thinking and looking and seeing to sense that there's something profoundly wrong with the the inequity of the distribution of our comforts mm -hmm. uh, I, and it breaks my heart and i i want to do something about it like i really in fact i want to devote a lifetime to doing something about it in fact that's i can't think of anything more important to devote a lifetime to than to ameliorate these myriad injustices and in that in that work in that process of trying to do something about all this suffering that i see around me and I have to engage with those who are actually disempowered, the other side, you know, the, the ones that have been persecuted and uh, traumatized. And, and I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's, 
the way we are talking about this and the way that we propose to do something about it comes from a place of empowerment. We come from the empowered side and we're trying to fix the power imbalance. And then there's another side that is has been disempowered and has accumulated, you know, deep and accumulated trauma. And they're very angry and hostile and dent and hurt and you know angry for and rightly so. But the point is that there's an energy that comes from the disempowered side that then can easily like attack us too. Like mm. Yeah, well, that's a misplaced pain from the trauma. And for me, I don't see it as sides, right? I, I do see it as you could see these definitive experiences. But when I, I look at trauma from my studies around trauma, trauma is not in the act itself that we experienced. It's how we carry the relationship to that act. I, I guess I just am hoping that there's an opportunity here for us to take that power that we have and do something with it, to do real healing. Um, not for us, you know, even though we're traumatized too, but we're, we, we need to be able to actually absorb the hostility because the hostility is, a, is an expression of the trauma. And the empowerment that we have is the reason, one of the reasons we have it is to, to be able to accept that hostility. You know what I mean? And, 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 and do something with it. Yes. And, and let's just be clear of what we're talking about when we say trauma, right? Trauma is, and, and correct me if you see it differently, but trauma is an experience that we had that we experienced as being dangerous or detrimental to our health or safety. And as a result, we have either built up constructs in our psyche, our mental, physical, or emotional bodies to adapt to those situations and to keep ourselves safe all i would say is that i i wouldn't i wouldn't limit it to any particular experience of of, of injury it's when it's systemic it is constant T to some degree we're all living in a systemic state of trauma well we are we have familial we have cultural right we have all of these different layers that go on top historical and then there's also natural traumas you know biological you know the lizard brain like is doing things that don't serve us in our current day and age but they're still doing it you could even think of you know the the asteroids that took out the dinosaurs as a historic trauma that has been since you know it has been integrated and has been but it's still there you know it's still in our body plans it's still in the landscape it's still in the distribution of reptiles to mammals on the, across the planet. So trauma is ubiquitous. I just think that we, by accidents of circumstance, have a, have a margin of energy to work with to try and heal it. Well, and, it. When, and let's be clear, when you're saying it, we're talking about the specific inequalities and injustices through our current and past systems. Is that correct? Yes. I wouldn't congregate them all into one thing like that, except to say that the schism between the schism from nature and self, the separation, the divorce that we've all suffered when we started to think that we were separate from nature is the root cause of all of the downstream traumas like political, economic, racial, xenophobic, all those other things. Those are all downstream symptoms of that much deeper trauma which was our separation from nature mm. and that if and that if we can somehow restore that sense of belonging to nature then over time these downstream traumas like economic exploitation like hyper consumption like accumulation of wealth to the detriment of everything else mm -hmm. those those inherited traumas will begin to ameliorate i'm not Again, I'm not a utopianist, but I'm saying that we will begin to see better ways through this stuff. And I guess that's the opportunity, like what you're speaking about, um, when you're speaking about the privileged upbringings that we had in comparison to, you know, um, many other people who did not have the same um, access and freedoms. With yes. any any group that is 
awakening to this awareness of these inequalities and seeing opportunities to correct that, they get to be the torch holders of trying to aid that resolve. It seems that regardless of where you are and what your privilege has been, because we've all had privileges, we've all had these challenges in, in totally different ways. And uh, there's probably this natural relationship to our privilege being able to resolve the, the inverse of that and vice versa. So there's something really nice about that as back to the, you know, fractaling. Uh, and it's hopeful to me. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's, a reason to, it's a reason to get up in the morning. Beautiful. Well, Rich, man, I'm uh, so. Can I, if if you're going to sum up, can I drop an idea bomb on you before you do, Absolutely. and then maybe we can use it as the next podcast someday? Absolutely. So this idea bomb is this: there's an idea called uh, an activism or an action, which is this understanding that consciousness itself, like human consciousness, the little voice inside our heads that tell us who we are, consciousness is not does not come from us alone. It's what's required for consciousness to happen is a world manifesting itself through a nervous system as this thing we call consciousness. That's what the idea of an activism is, that, that mind is a function of neurobiology and world, right? Well, neurobiology and world are really the same thing, world. So consciousness is really a feature of the world, not us. I know that sounds very panpsychist. But here's my, here's my idea bomb. This age-old argument that's been going on in philosophy about free will versus determinism, like that everything's determined versus the fact that we feel like we have agency, is going to be upended by this idea of an activism to the point where this argument about free will becomes irrelevant. What I'm trying to say here is that if you look at the history of the universe and if you look at the emergence of life, which didn't happen like overnight. It was a long drawn out process over thousands, maybe a million years. What you see is that the things that non-living things do like little proto cells or even minerals or even you know grains of sand, they move, they do things in the world, right? The world impinges some kind of effect into material things, things that aren't even alive. That I am proposing. I don't have the science to back it up. I'm not doing science here. But I propose that that, that, that idea that the world impinges an impulse into a non-living material thing is the precursor to consciousness. And consciousness, as we experience it, is really just a high order manifestation of that exact same process so that means that when when we think when we hear the voice in our head telling us who we are and what the world is that's actually the world saying that through our consciousness as far as i can tell the entire history of science the entire what we know about the universe scientifically is absolutely consistent with what i just said with what Rumi said. That's mm. what Rumi was tuned into. Love you, Rich. You are a beautiful soul. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining today. Awesome, Bri. Thanks. Thanks for joining us this week on Growth Guide. A big thanks to our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Morning Man. Live manly, own the morning. I learned about this from UFC champ Frank Shamrock. He was always having trouble getting started in the morning without like seven or eight cups of coffee. No exaggeration, I've seen this in person. So he created this product that's packed full of 45 superfoods and it has 95 milligrams of clean caffeine. So you get that charge from the greens and also get a hit from the caffeine without feeling all jacked up. I'm definitely caffeine sensitive and I like this product because it doesn't make me feel like I'm bouncing off the walls, but I feel sharp and energized to get shit done. Visit growthguide.love forward slash morning man to learn more and use promo code growth for 15% off. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Atmananda Yoga. You guys have got to check out their yoga alignment mat. 
I've been using this for a long time. As you know by now, I've studied and trained with them as a yoga teacher, and the mat is incredible to deepen your practice and to ensure a lifelong injury-free practice. Visit growthguide.love forward slash alignment for more info or to buy. Be sure to use code GROWTH at checkout for 15% off. Make sure to visit our website, growthguide.love, where you can find freebies, exclusive content, and subscribe to the show so you'll never miss an episode. If you found value in listening, I'd really appreciate a rating on iTunes. I can't tell you just how important this is. Or spread the love. Tell your friends, your fam, heck, tell your spirit animals. And follow me on Instagram at growthguide.love. Be sure to tune in next week for our newest episode.